what what does this overhaul look like if it ever does happen? You know, one one shift is that uh, there's a lot more uh, uh, powerful institutions which focus on the community rather than the individual. I mean, we've seen that repeatedly. I mean, what happened, you know, from the late 1920s by the time we hit the late 1940s, right? Um, we were a much more um, communitarian nation. Uh, privilege yielded to inequality. In fact, the last time when we saw huge declines in inequality, Gini coefficient kind of going down, as economists would measure it, was really from the mid-1930s all the way through the 40s, the 50s, and into the 1960s, boomers coming of age, inequality is generally on their watch gone the other way, right? It's increased again. Our next guest is Neil Howe. He is a managing director of demography at Hedge Eye Risk Management. And we'll be talking about his outlook on not just the economy, but how uh, demographic shifts over generations will impact not just the very fabric of society itself, but our investment in financial decisions. Welcome to the show, Neil. Hey, David. Great to be here. Great to have you. You have a very interesting line of work, which is to analyze demographic trends. Uh, before we talk about your book, which we'll get into uh, in more detail, uh, tell us how and why is it that crises occurs or a crisis will occur, usually has occurred every 80 years or so, which is something you've outlined in your work. Yeah, that, uh, well, written about that in several books, uh, going back to uh, Generations, 1991, The Fourth Turning, and, and my most recent book, I'm sure you're going to get to. But um, the the uh, we, we did not set out, I should say, Bill Strauss, who was my co-author for many years, who recently passed away, but we did not set out uh, to look for cycles in history. Uh, we were just interested in generational change uh, and uh, and how different generations sort of focus on different things and, and want to leave behind different legacies and a different approach to politics and family making and so forth. But what we discovered uh, uh, was that uh, that that these these generational types, these generational collective persona, uh, sort of arise uh, cyclically. Uh, they they tend to repeat, you know, over time, and it's associated with a with a long term rhythm that's well known to most historians. And that is, we have these uh, in in American history in particular, we have these monumental civic crises about the length of a long human life apart, about eighty to a hundred years apart. Uh, we had this uh, enormous period in the late 17th century, the Glorious Revolution and enormous rebellions here in the colonies. And then about a long human life after that, we had uh, the American Revolution. Then we had the Civil War. Then we had the Great Depression, World War II. And here we are today, right? And in fact, this is a pattern that is not just true in America, but increasingly in most of the world. Um, just think, I mean, World War II and the Great Depression were global events. And many of the things we see today globally, the decline in global trade as a share of GDP, uh, the rise of uh, populism and authoritarian uh, 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 governments around the world, uh, reminds people of the 30s. And we're seeing it again, right? The same kinds of trends, the same uh, emphasis on uh, uh, zero-sum thinking as opposed to positive-sum thinking, this kind of ethnocentrism arising around the world. A lot of these things are coming back. And uh, we started writing about this long before any of this happened, you know, yeah. back in the late 1990s. Uh, and uh, we, we I, I have seen it unfold, uh, you know, largely uh, following what we anticipated uh, when we first wrote about this. Uh, uh, the, the Fourth Turning, which is a book we wrote in 1997, uh, came out at a time when, um, you know, Francis Fukuyama was talking about the end of history. You know, governments would fade away. The microchip would uh, get rid of all the dictators. We would democratize information. <laughs> well, <laughs> we didn't think so. Uh, and we kind of stuck to what we saw as being this long-term social rhythm, which works through generational change, David. So you want to know what, well, what keeps it on this timing? Well, the timing is is determined by phases of life. A generation in its youth and coming of age is shaped a certain way by history. And about 40 years later, it becomes the leaders and the midlife parents and so on. And they shape history, right? Which shapes the next generation. So we see a constant process of compensation and correction. You have a very civic generation like the GI generation, 
uh, the generation of um, you know John Kennedy and Ronald Reagan and 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 uh, Bush Senior and and all of those generations, uh, which was a very powerful civic generation in American history. You know, as young people took us through World War II and the Great Depression, and were very powerful as elder leaders. Yeah, you know, the generation that came of age when they were at their peak were boomers, much more focused on vision and values, sort of the internal life. And we see that as a very basic um, uh, yin and yang, so to speak, in the generational cycle, because halfway in between these great civic events, which reshape our outer world, are the great um, uh, upheavals in our inner world. These are called the great awakenings of American history. And we actually give them names. We talk about the first great awakening, second, third, mm -hmm. fourth great awakening. And we had one in the late 60s and 70s. And these occur roughly half in between. So you go back and forth between great civic upheavals, great values upheavals. One, we reshape the outer world of uh, you know economics, politics, infrastructure. The other, we reshape the inner world of values, culture, uh, religion. And, and this gives you a very good idea of thinking long-term. That is to say, where are we in this cycle? And what do we expect? And the longer term you go out, I think the 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 better the rhythm is. Um, one last thought. I mean, you you introduced you called me a demographer, and uh, and mm -hmm. it's true. I mean, demographers. Um, I do this. You know, we talk a lot about uh, population numbers, uh, fertility, mortality, migration, morbidity. You know what I mean? All that kind of stuff. And we and we give our calculations of, of population numbers. But I think the broader the broader approach to demography as understanding what's going on inside people and how that's linked to how people age over time and are shaped at one period of the life and how that actually appears and manifests itself later in their life is a link between past and future was ne neglected uh, by most demographers and historians. Okay. Uh, I think we should back up here and talk about the shifts in generational values and uh, what uh, these shifts have meant for uh, for our society. We're talking about, or you were telling us about the coming crisis in the next decade. Could you attribute the roots of this next crisis to the past generation, either Generation X or the Boomer generation, and how they've perhaps failed us? Could we go as far as to say that? No, it's not failure. It just is each generation acting in its own way. Um, we get into these crises and we emerge from them. And by the way, we're already into this crisis era. These are eras. They last about a generation long. So you're thinking about 20 to 25 years. We think this recent crisis era started in 2008 with the GFC. Uh, and by the way, that's when you see a lot of these trends I've been talking about, you know, decline in global trade, the rise of protectionism, the, the decline in, in democracies as a share of, you know, global population and so forth. A lot of these trends you've seen since, uh, you know, over the last decade, decade and a half. So we have another decade or a bit more to go. Uh, we think this is going to be with us until the early 2030s. Um, and look, look at the changes we've seen over that period. Um, in regard to um, uh, the threat of both external and internal upheaval in our society. Um, civil war was not on anyone's radar screen a, a decade ago. Today, half of Americans believe one is very likely, you know, in the next few years. Uh, external war, great power war was not on anyone's radar screen. Look at it today. There is a reason why this comes back around. Um, and a lot of it has to do with the generations that knew how to run big institutions in civic life are gone. They're no longer with us, right? And the generation who had grown up in their shadow are now at the controls. This happens again and again historically. So we have now at the oldest uh, uh, age brackets today in our senior leadership of uh, this generation, which is very good at articulating values and uh, uh, and and telling us um, uh, what what kinds of priorities are important, but are not terribly good at practically, uh, you know, get, uh, uh, leading people and actually uh, producing results. Right? We see this in the U.S. Congress today, which is completely gridlocked beyond any recognition. They don't pass any laws anymore. 
Um, and increasingly, the public is turning to the idea of uh, sort of jumping the system. That is right. to say, reshuffling the Supreme Court, uh, giving uh, emergency powers to the executive. I mean, doing something, right, so that this country can govern itself effectively again. Well, well Neil, how, you talked about the GFC. You talked about the actions of politicians today. Why is it that you're attributing certain events, which really, when you look at it, are caused by a few individuals at the top, to generational attitudes? I, I mean, is there evidence to it's suggest not, that these, these things aren't caused by a few individuals at the top? Look at the new the trend toward populism and authoritarianism around the world. It's everywhere. It's in Brazil. It's in uh, it's here. It's in Southern Europe. It's in India. It's in Burma. It's in China. It's in Philippines. I mean, you, these aren't just a few individuals. This is a mood. And all of these leaders were born after World War II. They have a completely different generational experience. And so does their electorate. The younger generation today does not believe, is not ter nearly as attached to liberal democracy as the older generation is. We we talked about this extensively in research that's been done. Um, and this is a generation that is looking increasingly for stronger communities that can protect them and that can give them back some of the good governance, which they realize their parents have, but they no longer have. You wrote in your book, The Fourth Turning, and I'll just quote, in politics, millennials have become the most democratic leaning generation of young adult voters since the GIs during the New Deal. Among millennials, notoriously socialism is always as popular as capitalism. While millennials have been around for a while, their first wave is now reaching 40, they remain a study of they remain a study an unfamiliar contrasts. While all generations express rising discontent about America's current direction, millennials are the most likely on both the left and the right to believe that the current regime is fundamentally broken and needs to be overhauled, if not replaced. Why is this any different from any previous generation? Well, because I think previous generations didn't really want to overhaul it and replace it. Uh, uh, Gen Xers are fine. They just wanted to become winners rather than losers within the capitalist system as it was. Uh, boomers wanted to reshape America's values, but were perfectly comfortable with older generations running everything. In fact, uh, Boomer's only problem with government was that government did too much. Millennials think government doesn't do enough. Um, and as for the silent generation, they're perfectly comfortable as young adults during the 1950s and 60s. Um, they, they had no protest at all. Elvis Presley shaved his, shaved his head and went into the draft. I mean, you know, no one protested military service back then. The idea of, of, uh, of radical change uh, brought about either within or outside of the political system does not happen all the time. But we see increasingly it happening now. Uh, many places around the world is happening through the election booth. And of course, today we were, right, about every election. It's like a seismic event. You sort of grip your, you know, your arm chairs, right? Uh, 2024 is coming up. How is that going to go down? Is the other half of America to get to accept however that election comes out? Um, you know, uh, this is something we're not used to, uh, but it happens periodically in American history where we have that, um, that sense of unease about how these big decisions will be decided. What, what does this overhaul look like if it ever does happen? Um, I think it's going to do several things by the time we get to the end of it. Uh, one is typically in these four turnings from the beginning to the end. Um, you know, when, one shift is that uh, there's a lot more uh, uh, powerful institutions which focus on the community rather than the individual. I mean, we've seen that repeatedly. I mean, what happened, you know, from the late 1920s by the time we hit the late 1940s, right? Um, we were a much more... Um, communitarian nation, uh, privilege yielded to inequality. In fact, the last time when we saw huge declines in inequality, Gini coefficient kind of going down as economists would measure it, was really from the mid 1930s, all the way through the 40s, the 50s, and into the 1960s, boomers coming of age, inequality is generally on their watch gone the other way, right? It's increased again. Um, we see institutions becoming more authoritative. That's the same thing that happened in the last fourth turning, right? 
Uh, we came out of the New Deal with hugely stronger civic institutions, particularly on the national level. What, one thing that typically happens during fourth turnings is the nation suddenly starts dedicating a lot more of its attention and focus on long-term issues, big issues of infrastructure, constitutional issues, issues of debt, we can imagine today, right? Um, and typically, we don't spend much attention to those issues at other times. Um, and we, you know, in the book, I go through and talk about each of these fourth turnings in detail and how they've completely reshaped our country, uh, not just institutionally, but socially in terms of attitudes and the culture. We move from irony back to convention again. These are these are um, rites of passage for our society, adrenaline-filled rites of passage. It changes every generation that lives through them. And when you're thinking about eras like the American Revolution or the Civil War uh, or the New Deal, um, you're talking about everything we see today, high partisanship, a lot of pessimism, extreme conspiracy theories, um, and loss of trust in public institutions. It's only regathered when the, when the crisis reaches its climax. Yeah. The concept of generational shifts and types is, is an intrinsic theme in your book, The Fourth Turning. Yes. So you've outlined four types, correct me if I'm wrong, prophets, so prophets with P-H, Nomads, yep. heroes, and artists. Can you give us some practical examples of of each type, or one or two types? Uh, the differences in the characteristics. Yeah, yeah. prophet archetype would be boomers, uh, okay. and another type would be the missionary generation, born just after the Civil War, or or an example that everyone would recognize is the transcendental generation, born after the uh, the Constitution was was uh, established. Uh, that was a generation of. Uh, Walt Whitman and Thoreau and Emerson and and uh, Jefferson Davis and Abraham Lincoln, right? These are generations of uh, vision, values. They come of age at a time when the culture is going through an awakening, and that's typically how they're seen by young, by older generations. That's how they're seen by others throughout their lives. And I would say today it's fair to say that boomers continue to be associated with dominance in the culture. I mean, um, if millennials, however, might they disagree about their boomer parents about politics they all know the boomer discography of all the you know beatles to eagles uh, uh or or whole earth catalog or anything else that boomers have ever done in the culture so boomers typically become very strong in the culture and uh they're typically indulgently raised right after the crisis they come of age in the awakening and they give us the kind of leadership we've seen recently uh, generally tends to be more values-focused leadership. Uh, the next archetype would be the, the nomad archetype. Uh, that would be an example of Generation X, or the lost generation, which came of age in the 1920s. They're individualists. They tend to be materialists. They're cynical about the culture. They tend to be survivors. And in fact, uh, the whole um, the word survivor is one that we've attacked with Gen X, certainly in the culture. You know, survivor shows and survival stories um, and Gen X is usually the throwaway kids of, of an awakening. Uh, that was true of the lost generation, as we document, uh, you know, back around the turn of the century. And, uh, and it was true of the kids who were, you know, raised during the 1970s and 1980s. And uh, they lend a, a much more pragmatic dimension to leadership. They are today the generation which has not yet risen to national uh, leadership positions. They're very slow to leadership positions, generally because they don't really think much of, uh, of civic life. They tend to say below everyone's radar screen. Um, and they uh, tend to be, again, individualistic in their outlook. Um, another archetype we've seen, and we've talked a little bit about, is, the, is what we call the hero archetype. And that would be the GI generation uh, that, uh, you know, splashed ashore at Normandy and Iwo Jima and all the rest and and uh, gave us the uh, this ex extraordinary period of institution building right after World War, not only winning the war, the global war against fascism, but then giving us all these huge institutions, which have kind of guaranteed us peace and prosperity for so many decades, from the UN to the IMF to the World Bank and, you know, Bretton Woods and everything else we often talk about. An extraordinarily strong generation of leaders, been in office, were in office for a long time, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, 
Uh, and they typically, uh, they're typically born right after an awakening. They're protected as kids. Uh, they come of age at a time when the nation needs them. Uh, and they, um, and they preside as senior leaders over an era of prosperity. And I, finally, I, yeah. Yeah. No, please continue. Yeah. And, and, and finally, the art, artist archetype, who are the children of crisis, and they usually uh, are heavily protected, uh, kind of the opposite of the nomads uh, during a time of crisis. And they come of age as cautious and conformist. I mean, these were the young adults of the late 40s and 1950s. They were also the young adults of, uh, of, uh, of, of the period just after the Civil War, known for sort of the same kinds of collective behaviors. And um, I typically do more to sort of add, um, you know, uh, nuance and refinement uh, to whatever America is becoming during this during this period of what we call the first year second turning, a period of sort of affluence and uh, peace and prosperity. If I can just kind of look at the way you're describing this cycle of generations, is it fair to summarize it as a following, which is that prosperity usually leads to wealth wealth leads to complacency complacency leads to lower growth lower growth leads to hardship and the cycle continues is that a, a, a thematic reoccurrence in our society that is one way to see it uh i think i think the what's added to that is how that plays out generationally from the perspective of each generation um i have heard it stated that way right in yeah. other words uh you know uh uh yeah, peace and prosperity leads to complacency, leads to poor leadership, which leads to horrible things happening, which toughens the next, you know, toughens yeah. the people coming along. But I think what what is important to think about is the full range of generational experiences that leads to to each group born in every quadrant of that cycle. You know what I mean? And that's really what we look at. Life looks very differently to a Gen Xer who's raised his kids during an awakening. Uh, than it does um, uh, to a to a to a member of the silent generation who's raised his kids during the Great Depression and World War II. They see life in fundamentally different ways as they grow older. It, it's not an age thing. Like maybe you're younger, you become less idealistic as you get older. It's it, but it, it, across it, all no, generations, the age group is the same. No, it it's not an age thing. And uh, you know, there's there's the old quote about. Uh, you know, if you're, uh, you know, if, if if you're if if you're a conservative when you're young, yeah. you have no heart, and you're a liberal when you're old, you have no head, and that, yeah. that kind of thing. But but I think what what we see is is something very different, and that is actually basic uh, 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 behaviors and attitudes that you acquire when young. You actually do keep with you as you grow older. You express them differently, and they they appear differently when you're in midlife as opposed to when you're coming of age as a young person. No question about that, but they stay with you. Um, for instance, the GI generation that came of age uh, during World War II. We recently had a big movie about that. You know, with Oppenheimer came out. I mean, that was the mm -hmm. generation, right? That came of age during that you know incredible moment. Um, they thought that they were conquering the world for a long-term purpose, right? Which was to found these huge institutions. And later in life, when they were, you know, set up the, the uh, past the Civil Rights Act and the Great Society, and they were, you know, took America to Vietnam and they did all these things, they still thought they were doing that. They were just making these institutions bigger and stronger. They did not change as they got older. Uh, they were just unleashed. And of course, that's what boomers couldn't stand about them. Uh, they just kept on making this institution bigger and stronger all the time. And so eventually boomers did everything they could to weaken them or cripple these 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 things that they were building. And I think in some ways you see boomers themselves, even as they grow older, continue to have their focus on vision and values. You, yeah. you talk to the CPAC today and their, 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 their fundamental doctrine is that politics is downstream from culture, right? You got to change the culture first and then you'll change politics. I think boomers, even if they gotten older, have that very strong absolutist black and white, um, you know, uh, true, false, uh, you know, right, wrong version, rather than a pragmatic, let's build it idea of what you need for good governance. Boomers are definitely uh, continue to be values focused since we've gotten older, uh, as was the generation of FDR, Franklin Roosevelt, as that generation grew older, 
um, uh, values focused uh, to the last, and they got their much younger brain trust, you know, to actually design the programs and to get the Manhattan Project going and everything else. But 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 they they galvanized America in terms of a, a common language of values at a time when when America was in crisis. Your book focuses a lot on America, uh, or your books, uh, plural. Um, and over the course of America's history, as you know, the country has become a little more diverse and multicultural, um, racially diverse as well. How has how has this diversity impacted uh, changing values? Um, in fact, have you have you factored this in when talking about the cycles? Yeah, I mean, look, uh, uh, it's 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 not just within America. Uh, we think this this the cycle actually describes a lot of the rest of the world too. Um, okay, keep keep in mind that. Uh, you know, we talked about it earlier. The, the Great Depression, World War II, was was not just the United States. It wasn't even primarily the United States. It was all of the Anglophone world. It was all of Europe, including Russia, uh, and it was it was East Asia. Um, at the, uh, the East Asia had a revolution. Uh, uh, India had a revolution, and and in fact, about 30, 40 years later, when America was involved with you know Woodstock and 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 Kent State and all the protests. Uh, China was going through the Cultural Revolution, and the the Red Guard generation in China, of which Xi Jinping is an older member now, did everything they can to wipe out two thousand years of Confucian culture. I mean, that was a values upheaval. We, when we think about the late sixties, Americans sometimes think about Berkeley and Columbia, uh, but we forget, you know, Paris. We forget the, the the days of lead in, in Rome. We forget the Bader Meinhof gang. We forget what was going on in Tokyo. We forget uh, Mexico City, Buenos Aires. I mean, there was a youth rebellion around the world, and and many of these youth groups were uh, were shot down. Uh, it it was it was an awakening that was around. It didn't change institutions very much, but it absolutely changed. It absolutely crippled the authority of many of the leaders who were in power, uh, leaders who generally came of age during World War II. Look at Indira Gandhi, uh, look at, uh, well, look at Chairman Mao. Uh, look at all these leaders who came of age during World War II who were really yeah. crippled uh, by that period of awakening in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, and that was the change that occurred back then. So this is not, I think that the U, the America has the longest track record of this cycle because I think America was <clears throat> sort of free and modern a little bit earlier than other generations, uh, excuse me, than other countries. Uh, you know, uh, Alexei de Tocqueville used to say that, that in America, every generation is a new people. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and he put it that way to and demonstrate what was different about America. So I, I think that this this generational freedom to redefine where the country's going, began and developed very early in American history. But I do believe today uh, you see it around the world. Uh, so this is not um, this is not strictly speaking something that's you know only happening in America. I think more than ever this is this is happening in much of the world. Do you think the world, not just America, do you think most of the world is heading more towards socialism in our current uh, in, in in the latest generation? I'm not sure the word socialism is a useful way to talk about it uh, because it conjures up, you know, a lot of stuff that for most people, what happened in the thirties and forties, um, you know, maybe all the way up to the, to the early nineties. Uh, I, I think what it does conjure up definitely is a, is a, um, uh, a stronger, a stronger bond between citizen and state where the state is doing more for citizens and the citizens more is asked of citizens to do for the state. Uh, and I think that is something that that younger generations will ask for and will demand. Uh, and I think that's why you see these authoritarian rulers in so much of the rest of the world. These aren't rulers. I mean, you look at Narendra Modi in Italy. He's not a guy who says, oh, yeah, let's just marketplace do everything. No, he is in charge. You see him everywhere. He's on billboards. He's saying, I'm protecting you. We see the same thing in how many different countries. These are people who are going to say, I'm going to make the government take away the downside for you. I know that you're now hypervigilant to failure. We are going to protect your downside. So is it, will it redefine how markets work? Yes. Um, 
But remember what the GI generation did after World War II, right? We had a more structured and you could say regulated marketplace by the late 1940s than we had by the late 1920s, right? right. But and but that provided a foundation in which markets in this new environment absolutely thrived for the next several decades. Well, any 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 asset or company that's I guess investable in an authoritarian regime uh, would have naturally a higher risk premium. And so, if we're heading towards a more big brotherish environment, which I kind of is guessing is what you were describing, would that not just make assets in, in particular equities just riskier across the board is that what's it depends, happening because because during a crisis everyone becomes big brotherish right because okay. you're interested in surviving so in a way you might want to be uh in a big brotherish country during the most risky period right because you're interested in survival on the other side of that period you might want certain kinds of regulations uh so that markets will do better i'm thinking of any trust for example um, is that anti-market or pro-market? Well, it depends, right? Um, now, when when uh, the designers of Bretton Woods uh, put together their system, they actually didn't want international flows of capital. They thought that would undermine, you know, the global economic system, and we thrived without a lot of, you know, international capital flows. Of course, you know, by the 1980s, uh, uh, we let that go. But, but the point is, is that once you give free flow to everything, capital flows, labor, uh, you know, everything goes, you eventually end up at a time where you undermine people's faith in markets. I mean, do you agree? Yeah, I guess that makes sense. Uh, tell us about this crisis, and we'll wrap up after this. Tell us about this crisis that uh, is unfolding. You mentioned it started around 2008, the last GFC. In practical terms, what does this look like? What does this mean for the financial markets? I mean, clearly the stock markets didn't believe we were in a crisis for the last 15 years. <laughs> Post-GFC, it was the longest bull market in American history. Yeah, that, that well, that's true. Uh, of course, it went down a full at first. <laughs> sure, uh, yeah. But then it, then it came back. Uh, I think one thing you can say is that we're in a period of enormous volatility, uh, you know, both with regard to, you know, uh, uh, I mean, just look at the bond markets lately. I mean, you follow the VIX, you follow the move. I've never seen the move for what it is today. Um, so I think there's a great deal of volatility and uncertainty. Um, and and um, and I believe that will continue to be that way. Um, look, I'm I'm uh, I do think that that these four turnings historically, um, all of them, either climax with a um, a, a conflict. And the conflict is what settles all the open questions about community life. And it's either a conflict that's external or a conflict that's internal, or it's both at the same time. And we've had all of those, you know, going back all the way to the 15th century, right? And sort of the Anglo-American legacy. And we've had many examples around the rest of the world where we've had these, you know, total wars, either internal or external, which end very badly. So I'm not, you know, necessarily saying everything is going to end well, but I'm, I'm looking at the patterns of history and I'm looking at at where that goes. I do think that the we're looking to the rest late 2020s as kind of the the climax of this crisis era and um and it's going to be uh I mean one one thing that worries me on the outer world end is the fact that so many of the nations of the world and we saw this in the 1930s are beginning to align themselves, right? We look at Iran today, and Iran now has, you know, Russia and, and and China on their side. They never had that before. And so this increasing alignment of the powers into these big groups, these axes, as we like to say, again, remind, has to remind people of the 1930s. It certainly worries me. Uh, we have an election coming up in just a couple of few days in, in Taiwan. We're constantly reminded of these issues that are sitting there in the wings externally, and internally remains a problem for the United States. You you follow politics and you realize uh, how incendiary this coming election is. What what I see happening for for uh, you know what does well, I can just tell you generally what does well and what does badly during yeah. these periods. Please. Um, uh, uh, nominally denominated fixed income uh, always does badly. 
right? And namely because we always have financial repression and we try to inflate our way from out from under our debts. What really worries me is that even before we enter any kind of climax, we're already at 100% of GDP uh, uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, national government indebtedness in this country. Uh, that's where we reached after the end of World War II. We were at 100% of GDP. We're going into that, right, with this. So, uh, and I look, if you look at the CBO, they do a 30 year projection, it's completely unsustainable. It's unsustainable even at these utterly unrealistically low real interest rates they assume on bonds. I'm assuming that if we go back to a long term, I don't know, two and a half percent real interest rate, this thing becomes completely unsustainable. And the only way we get out there is to uh, inflate our way out of it. And that has been the the lesson of every single fourth turning in, a, in, in our history. We inflate our way out of it. We did that same thing, by the way, in World War II. About half of it, we inflated our way to get out from under it. The rest is through real economic growth to get under the, the obligation there. So so I would say that's one lesson. However much you might like the bond markets or curse them recently, uh, they've been up and down a lot recently. Uh, I, I think that's that's a danger. I do think that in terms of equities, um, uh, diversification is more important than other, particularly international diversification. And I would say in addition that there's going to be a shift, as always happens in fourth turnings, between uh, firms that focus on experiences and services and firms that focus on stuff. You know what I mean? Commodities, manufacturing, materials, that kind of thing. We've already seen. I mean, one one shift we've seen is is since uh, you know 2020 uh, 2021, this enormous outsized uh, 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 growth in any of the ETFs that are defense, and defense is still behind the curve because we can't we're not producing anywhere near the kind of weaponry and just the ammunition to keep up with the kind of conflicts that are arising around the world. This is a long term trend. So. Um, so are you describing this climax uh, of this crisis? Are you describing a scenario in which we get more regional conflicts, global conflicts, a depression in the U.S., global economic downturn? What What is the end result of this crisis is what I want to know? Uh, conflict. So it's regional and global conflict. Okay. Uh, you can't get a depression when a country is in an emergency because everyone's employed. You know what I mean? You just I go see. out and start you know, assigning right. people to do stuff. So. Right. So depression is always something that occurs outside of of of, of a crisis climax, um, but but I but I do think it's not just I'm talking about war, but I'm also talking about rebuilding. It is rebuilding. You look around America today, and all of the big infrastructure was built by the GI generation. It's 50, 60 years old. You go around and look at New York or Philadelphia. Go around and look at these places, right? It's crumbling. It's old. We've never remade anything. And uh, we're, we're great at, at, at redoing stuff like my cell phone and all these little individual products you buy. But instead of rebuilding the stuff we collectively enjoy that's made with real stuff, no. We let the previous hero generation build all that, and we've just been living off it ever since. That's going to have to be rebuilt. It's going to have to be rebuilt in a whole new way. You you mentioned the rise of populism around the world. Okay, let, let's just draw parallels to the late 20s and 30s, right? Nazi Germany arose from a populist movement that exploited fear in the in the population because the country underwent a crisis. Could the same thing happen again? Well, same thing happened in the United States, FDR. A lot of people thought he was a dictator. And in fact, many of the people, the editorials that called him a dictator, said that not, not as a bad thing. It was a good thing that he was a dictator. I mean, we have no memory of what that period felt like to the people who lived there. To the people living in the 1930s, there was only two futures for the world, communism or fascism. Liberal democracy seemed dead. And that is what leaders had to ne negotiate and navigate during that period. Um, and, and if, you know, and, and, and we forget too that that period we all think it you know ended with the World War II. It was a great war, you know we were all together. Uh, but up until that war started, uh, this nation was bitterly divided uh, between uh, between you know those who were part of the Popular Front with FDR and those who right. thought it was utterly hateful. It was you know Franklin, Stalin, or Roosevelt. 
but does our society uh, open or do values in our society today open up its way to embracing authoritarianism? Should populism get out of hand today? Is we that possible? We always become more authoritarian during a crisis. And we did during the 1930s, mm -hmm. but we did successfully. So it's not a question of whether we're going to get authoritarian. I think we will. The question is whether we maintain our values of liberalism and democracy and decentralized markets and all the other things that we like so that it survives and flourishes after the crisis. Um, that's, that's, that's where we're headed. Uh, I'm very hopeful. Um, and in fact, I, I find that the people who are least hopeful are the people who find that today's trends are just indefinitely going to go in their current direction. Rich get richer, poor get poorer. Uh, leaders get more and more authoritarian. People tune out more and more from politics. Uh, I see something different. I see a renewed engagement, uh, which has periodically happened in American history. It will happen and again. And it's a ticket to a better world. We need to go through a gate of history to get to someplace fundamentally different from where we now are. And my big conflict are those people who feel that history always happens in these very long-term linear trends. It doesn't. It goes through these cycles and these sudden discontinuous changes uh, in our system, both in our values and in, in, in our institutional life. And we're looking forward to a period in our history where, again, things are going to move very swiftly. Okay, very good. Neil, you've been the author of several excellent books. We'll put some of the links down below where we can access these books. Are you working on anything else these days? Tell us where we can find your work. Uh, I'm on Substack. Uh, I, I run a, uh, uh, a periodical called uh, uh, called uh, Demography Unplugged. So I think that's the easiest way. Uh, I'm also, as you mentioned, on Hedgeye. So I have a lot of institutional clients. And typically for them, mm -hmm. we talk about sort of long-term demographic trends and what's happening around the world. But these kinds of issues come up a lot and what they mean for sort of portfolio management and <clears throat> how you, how you, how you, um, how you invest against extreme risk is sort of an interesting question. Uh, but I would say, yeah, Substack, Demography Unplugged. I, I do have one more question before we uh, close off, uh, Neil. So we are about to see one of the largest wealth transfers in history as the boomer generation passes on their wealth to the millennial generation or perhaps even younger. Given their shifts in attitudes, values, how do you think wealth in the future will be, will be managed and perhaps used and consumed differently than in the past? Oh, gosh. Um, well, one thing I will say about the, the the wealth that millennials are receiving is that more than any other young adult generation, uh, this wealth is um, uh, it, <laughs> I, that it, if you look at very high income millennials, a greater share of their wealth is due to bequests than any earlier generation. Let me put it this way. We have these very wealthy generations that are now retiring and passing on. The silent generation and beginning with the boomers, right? Many of them became very wealthy. They're passing that on. Not a lot of millennials are making their own wealth on their own. Uh, and you can see that if you want, the distribution of income by generation, you can go on the Fed website and you can actually look at how that, how that breaks out. One thing to know about bequests and that is that, that everyone who looks at distributions, right, that the distribution of uh, consumption, you know, is moderately regressive. Obviously, rich people consume more than 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 poor people. Distribution of income is a little bit more, you know, a little bit more skewed. It, it, distribution of wealth is obviously very skewed, right? You, you have almost no wealth by the lower half of the population. But if you want to look at the most extreme distribution of all, Look at the distribution of bequests. I mean, they are incredible, David. Um, so you're right that the average bequest is going to be over a million dollars that's going to be going to millennials. You want to know what the median bequest is? It's more like $40,000. You know, enough to settle your parents' affairs, and that's kind of it. Yeah. That's what we're looking at. And so when people talk about this enormous transfer, I'm saying, yeah, it's going to be an enormous transfer. And it's going largely to a very small group of young people. I see. All right. Thank you very much, Neil. Appreciate your time. You're welcome. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe and follow Neil in the links down below.